execution. There you go. Um, so I'll now mute everybody, Jane, and I'll invite you to unmute yourself and get us underway. So everybody's in muted. Jane, whenever you're ready, unmute yourself. Right, okay, I've unmuted myself. Wow, wow. I think it's time for bed now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, well, thank you very much for inviting me. I think um, Mike kind of pushed me a little bit into this. It's very funny, but I feel today, tonight, I felt as I was going on stage to do a performance. And I know I've got an ex-opera colleague here, so he'll know the feeling. And it was like, <clears throat> I got to clear my voice and sing and all of that. But um, I'm very delighted because I have had a love of poetry. Um, well, not just poetry, writing or a lot of my life, most of my life. Um, and. Uh, I started quite young, but I was married to somebody who was a writer, my very, very young marriage, and uh, he was a writer and I wasn't. So I, for years, used to sing. But um, when I got, um, had an experience of cancer in 1989, it somehow kind of triggered a whole part of me, which often serious illnesses can do, to really reopened me to my creativity in other areas other than singing. And so this first um, poem, which indeed th there were three of them that have been set to music, but I'm not going to sing it. Um, this particular one was written at that period um, and it's called Tree. Green tree, gazing at me, gently nodding in the lazy breeze. Birds trickle through your branches, making music with your trembling leaves. I live in your body, catching your songs with my outstretched ears, bending time with the eternal dance of the changing winds. I am your spirit, you are mine, with your gazing branches and your trembling leaves. So also during that period, I had a friend, another um, singer colleague was quite, he, she said something very funny, which I turned into a very short poem, uh, uh, was around that same period. It's called Diva Disease. My best friend once said she envied me having cancer, a glamorous disease. She only had asthma. Nobody feels sorry for you when you wheeze. So, um, that one. Then, Moving on to um, the late 90s, when I started a creative writing, I first started going, getting into creative writing seriously, and I did a creative writing course. And my son, I know it was 1999, because my son was 17. And this was a poem I wrote about the fears that mother ha mothers have about their children when they're growing up and what's going to happen. Um, and very surprisingly, I entered it for a competition and it won second prize, but um, I think I was more excited about the money at the time. So this is called Not Yet. Your children think that when you're old, you can't or don't and never have, whilst you hope they won't. Not yet. I start to say, I remember when and watch his eyes glaze over like a Chinese takeaway gone cold. My son, 17 and high on youth. You, his eyes mock, you were never young. I thought that too about my mum, poodle permed and 53, laundered by marriage, fear like a streak of shepherd's warning in her face, imagining horrors. Miniskirt, the shortcut home, up against a tree, bang, bang, bang. She did it in the war, but thinks that was different. Says, have a nice time, dear. M praying that I haven't, not yet. My son, all wrapped up in his cliché clothes, basted in Hugo Boss, ready to go, going out into a world bulging with mother's fears. What can you say? Go on, try the lot. Do it, do it, all the way. The sooner the better. You'll learn. It's all been done before. There's nothing new. And then you think, but what if I'm wrong? And there is something else. Outside, 
a blackbird's going off like a car alarm. I call out, have fun, my voice rehearsed by love, saying nothing, not yet. Last night he was sick, became a boy again, held my hand, drowning. On the floor, a pack of condoms lay, unopened by his bed. I smiled, some things haven't changed, not yet. But what if one day you forget to dream and sit with your face in front of the screen, bang, bang, banging away on the net, virtual sex, empty, dead? Not yet. Never. Not yet. Okay. So this was um, a time I was experimenting a lot and I was also very um, taken with Carol Ann Duffy uh, as a poet and she she writes wonderfully but she had a book called The World and His Wife um, which you may have read some of her poems and she takes figures from mythology and also from the Bible and wrote poems about her imagination of how they would be and I decided I would write about Ava Braun it's called First Lady. It was all about power, power and fame. His, Uber Allers, mine over him through peroxide, devotion, the curve of my beautiful German breasts. Evesian, he called me, his little Eve, as he slid me down on red satin sheets, his hair grazing my back like black barbed wire. Sometimes he'd shout out loud in his sleep, Alles muss in Ordnung sein. Yes, mein Liebling, mein Mann, I'd coo, as I clipped and waxed his precious moustache. Decked in rubies and crepe de sheen, I danced to the music of Richard Strauss, the consummate party courtesan. In the bunker, he told me that I was his muse, confessed that without my love he'd never have had the guts. But the cycle had come to an end, he said, as he gave me his ring, made me his wife. For 24 hours I got my reward, the first Frau of the Third Reich. Later I laced the last of the schnapps. We kissed, I drank, he took up his gun. Mazeltoff, Valhalla! Adolf and Ava up in the garden, scorching the sky, galloping over the Siegfried line. Ashes to ashes. Und das war das. The end of the perfect race. Okay. It's odd, because that's quite a full-on one. Um, I think here... Um, oh, yes, I had a... Just a very light-hearted poem that is somehow along the same theme called Immolation. Top C, the colour of vermilion, rides to the gods like a winged messenger on a flaming pavilion. Oh, sorry, pillion. So, too much reading. Right, I, I, I believe from Mike that it's quite nice to read um, a little bit of text um, or narrative. And... Um, Staying somewhat with my um, singing theme, um, I'm writing a, a novel that I've been writing forever called The Voice Box, and it's actually about um, a very arrogant and egotistical diva, soprano. Um, I'm not going to tell you the whole story because it'll be just too complicated, but there is a, a rather minor lord who is in love with her, and um, he's besotted with opera as well as her. And in England, there's an opera house called Glindbourne. And for you who are from across the pond, it's um, um, set, it's an old country home set in the glorious English countryside. And they hold festivals of opera every summer and have done since in the 1930s. Um, and you have to wear evening dress and you can picnic and dine in the garden. And it's very glamorous. So this is a little excerpt from, it's about Sir Hubert. 
It's a perfect summer's day. Sir Hubert opens up the hamper, takes out the starched white tablecloth and smooths it carefully over the little picnic table. He is in his usual spot under the shade of the loping rhododendrons opposite the ha-ha, beyond which the sheep picnic on a simple diet of grass, blissfully unaware of the human activity in the next field. Lucinda couldn't come. What a blessed relief for Hubert. She hates opera, though only he knows this, everyone else believing she adores it. In the short interval following the first act, she likes to chit-chat in the bar about the singers. His eyes are forever darting this way and that, making sure no one important, such as one of the Christies or Sir Simon or a singer's agent, is standing in range of her penetrating county drawl. In evening dress, everybody looked important. Once, just as his wife was releasing the gates of her horsey voice on a judgment of a young Polish tenor, he caught a glimpse of that most illustrious of singers' agents, Ivan Penfold, snaking through the sparkling crowd. And he purses his lips like a dog's bottom, she whinnied with her own wrinkled lips. Oh, God. He wishes, as he does in every moment, that Bella could be beside him and not this musical philistine who in the drawing room has a cabinet devoted to collections of easy classics for romantic evenings and every other occasion. Lazy classics, Hubert calls them. He has come to loathe the seasons and certain movements, God help him, of Mozart's piano concertos. He can no longer listen to Mahler's fifth or Samuel Barber's adagio for strings without picturing his wife, maudlin face, glass in limp fingers, lolling next to a bottle of gin which is half buried in the crevice between the sofa and the cushion. She has requested Pashabel's canon at her funeral as the gates close on the coffin. I deserve a royal send-off, she reminds him when her sentiments are greased by alcohol to which he always replies under his breath, Handel's fireworks would be better where you're going. Okay. So, I don't know how we're doing for time. So, I think, um, I don't know whether she's still here, right? She seems to have gone. I have a friend who um, was coming on and she's not there anymore, but... Um, she, I sent her a poem that I wrote and um, she works in the field of domestic violence and she felt as soon as she read it that it was very relevant to people who um, worked, people that she worked with, her clients. Um, and when I read it back I realised exactly why she would think that, although it is essentially about the romance going after the first romance. Anyway, it's called When the Petals Fall. It is impossible to capture the perfect moment when love twines itself round two hearts like a garland of freshly gathered roses, the colour of blood. When the petals fall, time scratches the surface, leaving scars like blemishes on skin, like two hearts carved on bark wearing thin. The mark of love, fixed in mind but not in time, its velvet petals once rich with scent, touched, bruised now. When you look, you really see romance is born to fail. All human life, love, lies on the battlefield of passing time. And yet, a frisson lingers still, a hint of what once was and will forever be, the love you felt, carved on your heart, like your roots like a tree, the perfect moment when love woke you with a prince's kiss, touched you, marked you, and you wore it well, long after the petals fell. Just now, putting the rubbish out, slam of the bin lid, 
thoughts on myriad things. The sky met me like a lover, put his arms around me, amethyst cruel, and said, hello. I looked up at his vast open face and kissed him for taking me in, oh so gently in his arms. He whispered in my ear, everything is just fine. I gave him my best crescent smile and went back inside, soft and light as a star. Seems to be a little bit of a theme about love, but we're nearly there. I'm, I'm coming to the end of my poems now. It's quite a lot to take in. Um, this poem is called The Etymology of Love. We are all trying to express in our imperfection the perfection of love that changes its shape as the wind bends trees, solid in root, supple in space. The nature of love is true, yet we make up stories in the wind, give love names, meaning. Like the leaves on the trees that change colour from vibrant green to orange, yellow, brown, our stories wax and wane. And yet the root, the etymology of love, remains the same. Just two more to go, quite short. Imprints. Poems are little imprints of us, left behind like a shedding of a finer skin, skin that breathed tears and sighs and love, felt injustice, joy, a skin that never dies, that shares who we are, the particles, the beauty, the essence of us, not the grossness of how it all got acted out. And to end, it, it, this is a poem, I used to write a lot of poems on trains and obviously the last two years, I haven't really been on any very long journeys, but um, I, there's something about the rhythm of trains and the passing by of the scenery. Um, so this is called Now. Not a series of nows, but a now beyond the now of time. A poem on now, in the now, the future and past as one. There is nothing in now to be done. These words written now to the gentle flow of the train that streams past trees and houses, holding myriad nows of their own. There is nothing now cannot know. There is no strain in the now. It is the place where love grows roots, the eternal flourishing now, the Tao of life without pain. There is nothing now has to gain. Thank you. Thanks. Gain. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are, as I said at the beginning, we are blessed to have heard you. So thank you so much um, for sharing your words with us. It was wonderful. It was lovely to hear. So thank you so much. Well, thanks for coming. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Uh, okay. So now, <clears throat> following on from your, your poem, this now, is that we will uh, move to the open mic. Um, and those of you who are regulars will realize that the order in which you've given me your name is completely irrelevant to the order in which I'll ask you to read. Um, I have a request, Alexandra, you've requested that we I share, I, I share your screen. I'm not quite sure how to get you to share your screen, so I'll have to try and work that out. Mike, you may know how to do that. It's very easy. You just go to the share screen and allow for all participants to share. Oh, okay. Share screen, all participants. Oh, look, multiple participants. Um, one participant can share at a time, it says. So you probably can share 
um, at the moment? No, not yet. It has to be for multiple participants. Does it? Yeah. Then, then we'll do that. Um, uh, it says, oh, gosh. Okay, so it's saying... Okay, you've done it. Yeah, you've, you've done, done it. I have done it. I think I have. I think I have. Thank you. So, Alexandra, you're there. I'm here. Uh, I'm going to, yes. I'm, I've got to remove the pin. All right. Yay. Let's yeah. go. To all the young and older participants. My visions are my torture. My visions are my comfort. Turquoise visions, turquoise blind. For those whose hearts are not tired of sowing in the field of dreams. For the journey is bittersweet half hurt, half tenderness, like thorny milk thistle, like sweet smelling jasmine, accepting variety and different behaviours, going beyond wrongdoings and right doings, into new and more thriving harvests. My visions are my scrambling ascent. My visions are my sacred conquest. Turquoise visions, turquoise flying. For those whose hearts can admire the phosphorescent hopes of the sunset. For the journey is rugged half uphill, half downhill, like bare time in the winter cold, like bees gathering nectar from spring blossoms, evoking the rain's lament and the sun's caress, going beyond unpleasant and pleasant reactions to new and even higher peaks. My visions are my futile mirages. My visions are my sweetest oases. Turquoise visions, turquoise flying. For those whose hearts a refreshing fountains of muses songs for the journey is uncharted half tempest half tranquility like a wavy turbulent sea on a windy day like crystal serene waters under the shimmering sun Sailing over low and high tides, going beyond traumatic and fond memories into new and longed for harbours. My visions are my lightning duty. My visions are my radiant basking turquoise visions, turquoise flying. For those whose hearts shine brightly through storms, 
for the journey is evolving, half empirical, half innate, seeing what I encounter, seeing what I know, painting the world in dark and iridescent hues, going beyond detrimental and beneficial beliefs into new and more exquisite rainbows. Our visions are our unmanifested ashes. Our visions are our golden wings, golden visions, golden flying. That was, uh, thank you. Sorry, that was one poem, the whole thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you. Um, somebody joined in the middle of Jane's reading. It was a Tina. Has she now gone again? I think she has. It's a different Tina. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so, thank you, Alexandra. Let's now move on with the reading. And I'd like to invite, um, well, I think I'll invite Wheezy. Why don't you unmute yourself? I um, unmuted. Uh, and Jane, I wanted to tell you how much I enjoyed your reading. Um, I'm hoping I'm quoting you right. There is nothing in now to be done. God, I love that. And you're not yet gave such vivid pictures. Just enjoyed the heck out of that. Well, now there's going to be a little change of pace here. Um, I'm going to mention Santa Ana's and uh, you, you folks in England might not know what they are, but they're hot winds from the desert. So you'll know what I'm talking about when I, okay, this poem is called Tinsel's Tarnished Sheen. Los Angeles, built on charisma, wild creativity, orange groves, greed, tears, and blood. The movie game, unbridled, dirty business of illusion. Ruthless ambition in every genre. Dark film noir, rock those dreams. Writers hired, fired, never named in final scripts. Palm trees bend in Santa Ana's like studio suits, shallow roots. Ah, uh, but caution, they green light directors, cast and crew. Beverly Hills lawns, green as cash. Hollywood signs steeped in lore, steeped in myth. Every dream sung, unsung. The car, Los Angeles life's blood. Waivers left at Wilshire to the Pacific, Venice, Malibu Palisades, stars on sidewalks, Central City East, homeless rattle and prattle and try to cope. Not chic to love this inauthentic, manufactured, empty place. But ho, ho, yes, yes, I do. I am so very gauche. I love and desperately adore like breathing in magic, every tiny, shallow LA inch. <laughs> Thanks, Weezy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Next, please, um, Emma, would you like to go next? I will. I might just um, move to a room that doesn't have a noisy child in it. Um, so those of you who were there two weeks ago when, um, when I shared at Wagtail, you will have heard about my littlest boy, Zeke, who you might have seen on the screen today. So I thought it was only fair to share something about the other one, Eli. So this is a little poem about Eli. Eli is obsessed with running around and around and around 
in circles. And um, this is called Growing in Circles. My little boy, Eli, not much more than knee high, but my goodness, this boy loves to run. The way that he hurtles in endless circles is a perfect analogy of how I see my own life at times, running around in endless circles, thinking I'm getting somewhere, but no matter how fast and how hard I run, I keep finding myself back where I've begun. But then I look a little closer at my little Eli, racing around and around. He doesn't cover much ground, but I'm learning that these circles are taking him on a journey of growth. He's building strength and speed and agility as he develops the ability to build imagination with the creation of a new story with every lap. He's Lightning McQueen in a Piston Cup final. He's a plane about to land. He's a spaceship flying around the moon. He's a fleeing gingerbread man. He's developing endurance and self-assurance and spatial awareness as he runs. And no time is wasted as these fast-paced races at cardio workouts taking him to new places. So when you feel like you're going around in endless circles, running harder and harder, only to find yourself back where you started. Look for the growth. And like Eli, one day you'll outgrow those circles. Thank you, Emma. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for sharing. Now, um, I think next I would like to invite and welcome um, Freddie, please unmute yourself and uh, we'd love to hear you. Well, hi. Hello. So, um, I live in America, but I was born in South America and lived also for a long time in Europe. And I'll be reading from this book, The Bomb That Blew Up a God and Other Serious Poems. Mm -hmm. And it's a book with a lot of metaphysical poems, adventure, humor, lyrical poems. And Jane, Jane Metcalf, wrote a wonderful review in Amazon, which I'll read to you now. Poems for Humanity. Freddy Fonseca's substantial collection of rich poems span many lifetimes of living, contemplation, humor, spirituality, nature, love, and of course, God. Poetry is a specific way of reaching our hearts, hearts and souls without the need to understand in a linear fashion. Freddie's poems have the ability through skill and acute observation to reach all the parts of us. I will keep dipping back into this collection when I need to be re-inspired a writer after my own heart. Thank you, Joanne. <laughs> so I will read one of the poems that are both dramatic and lyrical. Antarctica, cold, cold, totally cold, colder than Alaska or Siberia, colder than the North Pole, Cold like a frozen soul, you are, O oh, H old Antarctica. Measureless and empty plains with silences as white and deep as death descended on me there, and frost besieged the air from rocks of ice around Antarctica. Dark and shapeless were the nights, while somewhere deep in space, the Milky Way rose beaming like the dawn, but never would the sun, and I withdrew behind Antarctica. Warm, warm, lovely warm, warmer than the Congo, Spain, or India, warmer than a bonfire has been my old desire, for always green tropical Trinidad. Riverbanks and stars arise, despite the walls of ice I once evoked around Antarctica, as I am reaching for my always green tropical Trinidad. Oh, there's the warmth of old in newfound Trinidad. 
Royal are the palm trees, timeless in the evening breeze, in always green, tropical Trinidad. Long ago, there was a time my heart was helpless in Antarctica. With blizzards all about, where life was but a shout across a desolate Antarctica. Dim is the light on snowy nights when I'm reminded of Antarctica. The cold is in my past because I changed at last. And so did you, O oh, old Antarctica. Warm is the light on starry nights shining over Trinidad. The warmth within her lovely name has burst into a joyous flame around myself, my age old Trinidad. Thank you, Freddie. Thank you so much. Um, I'll put a link into the, the chat where you can um, purchase it if you want. There are still a few uh, cheap copies on uh, Amazon, although in, the, in Britain it is officially out of print. But I will be uh, making some effort to get some reader distribution, but you can get some there. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for that. Look, I'm aware that um, those of you who are here for the first time, we do this on the third Wednesday of every month, and the Zoom link that gets you here is always the same Zoom link. So um, we feel enriched by having more and more different readers and listeners here, and it makes us um, feel stronger and more connected to a wider group. So if you'd like to come back, you're always welcome to come. As I say, it's the third Wednesday every month. So um, please make a note of the Zoom link. If you'd like to come back, you will always be welcome here. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Um, OK, so having said that, I would now like to uh, call on, I think I'm going to call on Elaine. Hey, good morning, everybody. And I too really relish meeting folks from all over the world. It's really, really fine. And, and my poem is, uh, can you hear me okay? Good. My poem is based on a true story. It takes place as, in an arsenal and uh, a wadwinder figures in the poem. A wadwinder, for those of you who shoot guns, uh, is a machine that puts the wads in shotgun shells. I'm not a gun aficionado, but I did work in this factory uh, when I was very young. It's called The Bride Stripped Bear. Tool and satin hang from the door of Lena's bedroom to grace her wedding day. The gown's lines are demure to reveal sleek arms toned from long hours at the arsenal's wadwinders. White roses will crown Lena's Gibson girl hair. She should have been a stylist, not pumping up shotgun shells in a noisy, dirty factory smelling of hot plastic. The beloved only daughter of a family of boys, all joining their father in the airless arsenal. Lena favors makeup and nail polish. For weeks, she has perfected the little ringlets adorning her beehive hairdo. And in secret, the tiny black dot she paints near her lips to astonish her beloved. Two days before the wedding, the temperature in the factory soars above 90. Lena's bouffant begins to wilt. One of her wad winders jams again. Her mind on the wedding dinner, on cutlery, 
candles, quinces, and plums. She bends over the machine with her screwdriver, forgetting to turn it off. As she is scalped, her scream barely registers above the din of the wad winders. Thank you. Elaine, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I think next I would call uh, Tina. Let's try you. Um, okay, so this is a, a post Valentine's poem, just to lighten the mood a little bit. Can you hear me? It's called No Card for Sue, or Self Love is Better Than Too Little Love. Sue looked out the window, watched out for the post, checked through her phone as she nibbled her toast. Did not know what it was that she minded the most. No card, chocolates, no blooms. No, I do love you, Sue. He said it didn't matter if he didn't say, I love you. Still, she gave him a call, but it went to voicemail. He was always so busy. Did he care? Did he howl? Sue felt left out and sad, but she knew what to do. Got dressed up for town, caught the 12.22. He had lunch at a bistro with complimentary box fizz. Bought herself chocolates and roses, signed a card with a kiss. I love you, she sang, and her heart felt replete. Back home with a rom-com, she put up her feet. And when he finally messaged, sorry, forgot, busy, dead beat, she took a big breath and at last pressed delete. Happy Valentine's. <laughs> sorry, I stopped my video, sorry. Thank you, thanks Tina, thank you so much. Um, and since that was about a Sue, I think we'll continue with a Sue. Sue, let's go. Good evening, everybody. Hope everybody's well, sending love. Um, and talking about love, this one is called Old Flame. A glance caressed my shoulder and trickled down my spine. It linger lit fires deep within that triggered me through time. And into space I rested in a memory once sublime. But that was then, and this is now, my love must redefine. I glanced across that crowded room and the same he was standing there those deep blue eyes that twinkled bright, that unruly shock of hair. Yes, I suppose we had a moment and some of it was fun. I don't regret the all of it, but he burned me like the sun. So I turned away, put down my drink, retrieved my quilted coat, gave grief goodbyes, no longing eyes, no sign, his glance still smote. I made it very clear that night, our, our rekindled love was not to be. His glance was still caressing as I left, but had moved on to my friend D. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, thank you. Um, okay. So next up, we're going to invite Janet, please. I've got an earbud in. I don't know if you can hear me. Can you, you hear can. me? We got you. Oh, good. Okay, great. So I live in California, but I'm on my sixth week of a Hawaii trip mm. with my husband here. And it's been wonderful just to get totally immersed in nature. So I've written some short poems. I'll read you one, then I have another really short one if you want to hear it. This one's called No Limits. The ocean's curl grabs my glance 
and denies release. A monster power with its unrelenting roar, the ocean throws its line in sand and rarely goes beyond. It knows its limits, but I do not know mine as I splash and gasp and stretch for safety once again. Thank you, Janet. Thank you so much. Did you say you had a short one? I do. I um, do do take that? a walk every morning. Yeah, hold on. I take a walk every morning and say good morning to passerbys. So this one's called Passing By, two short stanzas. I passed a lady today, floppy hat pulled low, eyes peering downward, a cymbal player looking for that one second of fame. I passed a lady today holding her clarinet, smiling eyes anxious for mine, fingers poised, lips on read, notes of love. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you, thank you, thank Ken. you so much. Um, okay, so next up, please, I think I shall invite, um, who's due? I think it's going to be Christine. Christine, unmute yourself if you would. Oops, sorry. Okay. This is about Bosom where we're going to have our special evening. Bosom, love at first sight. The winding road down to the harbour. Ah, the water, the white sailed yachts, ancient cottages and more recent rebuilds. It's visible history. It is captivating. We see the past and the possibility of a future. Along the shoreline are watertight cottages, their footings protected from daily high tides. Almost every garden or house boasts a model boat, a ship's bell or rope to signal the marine situation. The names too suggest the nautical and whimsical sea view, Harbour lights, oyster catchers, spinnakers. There are strings of shells and stones with holes. Roofs are thoroughly thatched or tightly tiled. The ancient church has a conical, comical spire. Here Canute's daughter slumbers on, while outside mossy gravestones are markers for the loved and lost, the young and the old. Life has gone on here for hundreds of years. It's reassuring. There's a fast flowing stream, clear water where our boy hunted for treasure in blue and white, and where once a year plastic ducks go bobbing along, bobbing along, and they will again. And there'll be daffodils too, nid nodding on the key meadow. The post office and store has gone, but there's the anchor blur for a pint and the papers. Diners and drinkers in all weathers admire the view. And even in squalling rain, tourists and yachties in wellies and waterproofs head for the ice cream man's yellow van. At high tide, Swans sail a stately measure under the tea shop's windows, and a hapless driver might survey her submerged car. There's much to love in Bosom. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. Yes, Dave the Ice is always there in the summer. Um, okay, next up, please, Jennifer. Hello. Can everybody Hi. hear me? We can. Hi. Hi. 
Thank you so much for having me. This is my first, first time. So I'm really, really excited. Um, so today I'll be reading two poems from my new book. Um, it's called Things. You can find it on Amazon as well as Kindle. Um, I will be putting a link in the chat box afterwards. Um, what's really special about my book is Yes, it has all the themes that poetry tends to bring out in all of us, but where do you see a collection that has that main vein of dealing with anxiety as well? Um, so a lot of my poems, um, they have that love, heartbreak, but the main overall theme as well is anxiety, dealing with anxiety as well on top of all the day-to-day -day or heartbreaks and things like that. So. I'll be reading two pieces, so I hope everyone enjoys. Prayer on my lips to the skies above. Psalms on my lips for the demons below. This is the prayer of the night, a plea for my heart, my mind, my body, a bargain to be struck between you and I. See, I, persons such as I, cannot feel. Portion of the whole, slice of the pie, piece of the puzzle, I feel it all. Like the ocean when it comes to shore and fills every secret place. An emotion takes over all that is I. Sensical nonsense is what I am told. Listen here, my dear, listen hard and good. Hear the fluctuations, the incantations of my tone, for I am built strong, but inside is a cave of crystal, fragile and iridescent, a place of wonder, where all the joys and the pain refract and travel through to the bottom, to the top, to the in-between. So you see when there is a heartache, a pain quite small, it splits into a million facets to see, a pain quite small turns into a funeral for the soul. So that's my first piece. Thank you. And then I have one more. Okay. When saying sorry isn't enough, when apologies don't cover the bills, when hunger strikes the belly, your sorry won't feed me. When the memories flood back of the pain and mistrust, your sorry won't erase from my mind. Keep the sorry, show me the regret. Keep the sorry, show me the fear. Keep the sorry, show me the understanding. Tie together the comprehension of the life you tattered, how you closed my eyes and placed rocks on lids when the mental pictures play over and over. How my body, tiny and frightened, tight under overgrown hands, feasting on a meal of innocence. How the sweet taste of fresh honey and snow white milk lulled you into a trance of rhythm and movement that wasn't made aware to young eyes. How you went about your day and never had a thought about the pain you caused as you kept coming back to the hive of my nectars over and over and over. So tell me where was the sorry in your dance of repetition? So now that the empty phrase, I'm sorry, decided to bubble from your mouth after your body won't function, after the sins have caught up, after the fun was less. So now is when I finally get that apology that the old me needed, that the young me needed to feel, to be free of a weighted guilt of another, to bury the anxiety that creeps to my today, day after day of the possibility of the next illicit interaction, so now is when you come to say, I'm sorry for stealing my piece of peace now and forever. And I can't give it back. But to you, the sorry is enough. You think, but a little think. You think to think that your sorry has that much power to change the marble of a body that you've chiseled away. But then I came to sand the scars away and create a masterpiece, an artist. I am Michelangelo of aggression, a Picasso of pain. So when you come to feed me a sorry, regardless of the intention, remember, I don't eat, I'm sorry, no more. And thank you guys so much for your time and for listening. Thank you. Jennifer. Thank you. Um, whereabouts are you in uh, the States? I live in a very tiny town in Florida called Northport. It's Southwest Florida. So I think the closest town people 
identify it with is either Sarasota or Tampa. So in that vicinity is where I'm at. <laughs> okay, thank you. So will you come back, do you think? Or oh, we'll, I definitely okay. wrote it down in my book. Every, every month you guys will probably see me. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much. So next we will ask Britta, please. Britta, would you like to unmute yourself? Thank you. I hope you can hear me okay. We can. I hope you don't have too much storm up there. Uh, well, I was just about to say I enjoyed the, the backdrop of Hawaii and all these sunny places. It's blowing an absolute coolie here. Oi. So far, well, the house is still standing, so fingers crossed. Okay. I've got three tiny poems for you. They're all related to time. Last day at the seaside. Time to pack up, go home, leave behind my favourite clifftop view, the very spot where I wrote and saw and breathed into tiny sunsets. Leave the harbour walls where I hummed secrets at sleeping ships. Time to bury, hide the most magnificent grain of sand in the depths of this beach. Hope and trust that someone else will find my pleasures, mend all broken pieces, make them their treasure, and continue the story. Easier time. Easier time withdraws into the curl of a fist with seed-like patience. Sooner, soon, roots and shoots will sprout flowers fruits, to like the warmth, such an odd and seasonal game. The fickle tick of my eachness rules the stubborn talk of allness wonder with pacemaker precision. One moment's peace tastes of earth, blood and honey. The phone call. Sometimes in that sweet spot when days fall off cliff and souls can wander on any given cloud, we chat forever. Neither of us rang. We meet out of time and five and twenty, fifty-one. I hear you smile as my heart leans against yours for a good night kiss across wells. Then the alarm goes off, lights on, and the line is dead. We, however, we're still smiling. Thank you. Thank you, Britta, and welcome back. It's great to see you again. Thank you. <clears throat> um, okay. Uh, Mike, how about it? Hello, thank you very much. Um, Thanks everyone for coming along. It's, it's really great to see so many people. Um, and if you're there, Jane, and you can hear, thank you so much for that fantastic selection um, of poems and, and, and the short story extract. Um, <clears throat> uh, Jane didn't plug her book, but I'm gonna plug it for her. Um, so <laughs> this is Jane's book that she mentioned. It's Things in Heaven and Earth. Um, it's a fascinating tale, actually, um, regarding her first husband, Colin, who was um, latterly uh, a, a BBC Radio 4 dramatist, a radio, a radio playwright. Um, it's really interesting. Um, and uh, she's on the phone. <laughs> um, so if anyone's interested in it, um, do have a look um, on Jane's website or on Amazon. Um, it's a fascinating tale, a true story, really, of two people who met in the 1970s. Um, and experienced an, an incredible um, awakening, basically, um, by meeting each other. So I'd implore anyone who's interested in that kind of thing to go and have a look. Um, and thank you, Jane, uh, for your wonderful, <laughs> wonderful presence this evening um, and the, the great um, poetry. Um, and everybody else as well. The, the, it's just so nice to hear everybody's um, contributions. Um, and there's so much to enjoy on these on these Zooms. It's brilliant. Um, uh, I didn't know what to read tonight. I have written some new stuff recently, but I don't feel like reading it. <laughs> um, so I'm going to actually read something that's really old. I had once long ago published a self-published poetry book, um, but I 
I unpublished it because I wasn't happy with it. Typical perfectionist. Um, but this is a poem from that and it's called The Bogeyman. Um, so for those in the States, I think you have the boogeyman or the bogeyman, but it's like this mythical kind of um, character that often parents tell their children about um, to frighten them. <laughs> um, this sort of um, spooky, the bogeyman. So this is it. The bogeyman believed in the town, but the town did not believe in the bogeyman. It was a tragedy. He'd have had long legs and long fingers, sharp elbows and tall toes. He would have eaten pensioners for breakfast. He might have peeled you with his nose. But they wouldn't have it. Instead, they had father, mother and Uncle Bill, the townsfolk, all keeping us safe from the kill, and the nurse and the vicar, the mayor and the dock, the judge in the courtroom with wig and with frock. And at the edge of the town, the bogeyman stood under a tree, felt very small, and wondered why he ever believed in the town at all. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, nice. Like it, Mike. <laughs> Okay, um, Karen, Kaza, thank you for still being here. Right. Okay, yes, I'm yeah. still here. Good. Still here. Yeah, um, just a wonderful morning for us, evening for you for of readings of poetry. Jane, uh, just really enjoyed your reading so much. Um, I'm going to be hoping to be able to rehear this on the recording to just hear the, some of these again because they were just so lovely and um uh, i love the when the petals fall poem that was just terrific and uh poem uh i don't know what it was called but when this you had the line the sky met me as a lover oh man that was just fantastic so um <laughs> But there are a lot. I couldn't write them down fast enough, but um, I wanted to just take them in. And um, I just wanted to mention to Emma, I can't believe you are writing poetry with two little ones and such great poetry. So I appreciate that you find the time somehow to do that. That is just tremendous. So um, anyway, so my, I'm, my poem is going to be uh, about uh, the, the weather. <laughs> Even though I live in Southern California in Ventura, uh, we can have some very cold nights. And one of those cold nights I was out uh, having dinner with my daughters and their uh, boyfriends and um, it was really cold. So this is the poem I wrote. Uh, it's called Shivery Embrace. Winter's chilly broadcast seeps into the marrow of time. Its forward march falters, freezes the bone, encases like a tomb. But the pug-nosed daffodil waits underground for sun's beckoning warmth, a future memory of days basking in pure, naked, quivering air. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Kaza. That's lovely. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Holly, tis you. Um, good evening, everybody. Hello and good morning to those who are in mourning. Um, it's been very lovely hearing all these different styles and all the music and all the different words. It's, um, it's very full evening. Um, I'm going to read something which isn't a poem this time, so I've just got it up on my screen. It's um, a little bit um, from a piece I'm writing about a village I um, have visited and spent some time living in on an island in Greece. And I went there because um, one of the things I love and I'm very passionate about are mills, all sorts of mills. 
And I read about this um, village in a newspaper in Greece and I decided to go and visit it. And so this is just a piece of writing I'm doing about the village. So I just thought I'd read on um, prose um, this evening just for a change. Um, so this is um, a chapter, it's um, Discovering Olympos, which is the name of the village. I first read about the village of Olympos on the Greek island of Karpathos in an English Greek newspaper. They wrote of how Olympos was a village still living partly in the past, where the women wore traditional costumes and hand sewn boots and baked bread in communal ovens with flour ground in windmills, of which there were 70. It was not so much the description of the costumes, boots and ovens that caught my attention, but the windmills and the fact that there were 70, which seemed slightly excessive for a single village. I was intrigued, especially as I love mills, and as such, Olimbos was definitely a place to visit. It was not until two years later, however, that I managed to get there. I had no preconceptions of what Olimbos would be like, in truth, I was slightly apprehensive, as all of the Greeks whom I had told I was going looked at me askance, a mixture of curiosity and alarm on their faces. You're going to Olimbos? Do you know what it's like? I've heard they are backward. They still speak Dorian Greek. Have you packed lots of things? They might not have running water, electricity. Are you sure you should go? Unperturbed. I caught the boat one sunny afternoon from the port of Satia in East Crete, and about five hours later I was standing on the quayside of Diaphani, a small coastal village on the northeast coast of Carpathos, nestled beneath hills, covered in pine trees bent double from the wind, their branches reaching out towards the east. Somewhere up in those hills was Olimbos. I waved to the boat and smiled at a little old lady clad traditionally in a black coat, a white embroidered underfrock and brown patterned hand sewn boots and asked when the bus to Olimbos left. 4.30, 5, 6 o'clock, she replied. Hmm, I thought, okay, and sat down on the curbside. The lady sat beside me and took out her crochet. About 5 p.m. the bus driver appeared, saw that I was the only passenger, flagged down a pickup truck to take me and returned to the cafe, I think for another game of backgammon. The road to Olimbos wound up and up and up through the green fragrant pines, the river valley winding below. Finally, after doubling back on itself again and again, we came to a fork, a road split off to the north, continuing upwards. Our road sloped down and continued through another valley until we rounded a bend and there, scattered along and below the crest of the opposite hillside, with the lights just lit in the windows and narrow streets and the remains of the sunset in the sky to the west behind was Olimbos. Silently and for just a second, I stopped breathing and stared in delight and surprise at this hidden, quiet, secret place. Against the darkening skyline were what seemed like a row of small square towers stretching the full length of the village like sentinels on the watch. Windmills. <laughs> thank you, Holly. Thank you, thank you. Lovely. Um, so I hope, um, Everybody that wants to read has read. Is that so? If um, if anybody has not had the chance to read that would like to read, please um, turn your mic on and shout at me. Um, otherwise, I'm going to assume that you're OK. All right. So I'm assuming everybody's OK. I'm just going to read one. I was struck by Jane's um, comments about now. And um, so as a, as a uh, you see the background, as a physics teacher, I sort of am fascinated by time. So I'm, I still haven't got my head around the idea that everything, everywhere 
is still going on right now. And that just seems strange to me to think of everybody I, I know are just is just going about their business right now and doing whatever it is they're doing. Just, you know. So this is called Chance Encounter, and it's about that. I met her at the corner of Chestnut and Main. Of course, I didn't mean to. It was some accident of chance or design of another's making. And so we spoke awkwardly as strangers will with nothing in common that they yet know of, probing through conventional conversation until a spark ignites or sputters. Our words have long since fallen into memory's cavernous vacuum and we parted easily, gratefully, relieved of the burden that casual social intercourse brings. Years later, on this dull street, a scent on the breeze blew me back there, and I wonder absently if she remembers me at all and what she is doing at this moment in our once shared time. So, everybody, brilliant. I just want to say again, I've said it before, um, it's just fantastic that we have people from such a range of backgrounds coming here um, and reading, and it enriches us all. So I really hope we'll see you all again. Um, and just to remind you, those of you who are in the UK and are near Chichester on the 24th, that's Thursday, the week tomorrow, we are at the Anchor Blur in Bosom, um, reading about love and loving. On the 2nd of March, we are at Wagtail Coffee and Yoga for our regular open mic. Um, and on the 16th of March is our next Zoom, four weeks today. Um, and we think we might be, I'm not sure if we will or not, but we're going to, at some point soon, we're going to experiment with doing the Zoom from the coffee shop from the cafe. So we're going to try and make a hybrid Zoom. Now, it may be next time, it may not. The featured reader next time is Chris Hardy. If you don't know him, um, look him up. Look up the information on the website. He's also a guitarist with a band called Little Machine, who um, feature poetry in their performance. He's wonderful, great reader. It'll be a wonderful time. So if you can... Um, Check that out and sign up and come and see us next month. So wonderful to see you all. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing everything. It's brilliant to see you. And those of you who are new, we hope we'll see you again. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, so good and to thank see you. Thank you. Everyone wants to thank you. Un unmute yourselves and say goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> hey, thank everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Nice, bye. Nice to bye. Oh, yeah. Nice to meet you, Freddie. Yeah. Nice yeah. to meet you. Uh, yeah. so Thanks okay. for coming, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Jane. Bye. 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 Thank you, Jane. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, -bye everyone. Bye. Freddie, good to bye. see bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Stay safe, everyone. Yes, thank you. <laughs> you too. <laughs> Stay warm and don't don't blow away. <laughs> well, no, it's Britain and Scotland is in danger. Yeah, yeah, it's away. <laughs> yeah, that sounds pretty pretty strong. It's grim. It's it's big storm. Mm. Even for us. Mm. Wow, you've had quite. They've had quite a few up north because my friend Sheila lives up there in Cumbria. I know she does. I know. Yeah. Well, yes, and there's another one coming in on Friday, which is worse than today, apparently. Mm. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Got quite a few more weeks of winter, huh? Indeed. All right. You take care. All right, see darling. Yeah, good to see you. Take care. Bye, bye everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye. I am now about to end the meeting. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>